Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. I'm going to pick up where we left off yesterday and we're going to move ahead a little bit, I think. We'll see what happens. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence into this meeting and we pray for one another. We know, Lord, that um, there's many struggles that we face in life. We pray that uh, those who are searching for truth, that you can draw close to them and that you can help them and encourage them, encourage each one of us as we go through this day. And we just ask for your strength and your power in our lives. We ask for your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and minds as we look at your word and we seek to find an application to ourselves personally and to our time. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so... Yesterday was a little bit of, well, we would say a bit of a sidetrack in a number of ways. So one of the things that we were really examining is, um, first it was based upon Ellen White in uh, Isaiah 28, uh, verse 3, where she's going to take an ironic verse referring to um, the king of Tyre, um, and she's going to flip it around and have it refer to Ezekiel. And then and I suggested that that was a, a symbol attaching Ezekiel to this movement in that uh, Ezekiel represents this movement. And we do that with uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, the fifth day of the fourth month, July 21st, 592, uh, which is midnight and parallel Samuel Snow in Boston, and uh, so that symbol that connects us to that movement shows that there is, uh, even though it's Ellen White uses it in a complementary sense, that verse to Ezekiel, we use it then applied in the ironic sense to this new movement in that we think of ourselves better than we are. So we spent some time on that. And then um, Kelly had directed us to uh, this verse, or passage in the spirit of prophecy, which refers to, uh, in a sense, an oblique way to Moses speaking out, you know, if Israel's not saved, blot my name from the book of life. And again, we, we take here a, a statement that spirit of prophecy is using in a much different sense uh, than was used in, in, in the scripture. That is, when Moses says this, you know, you know, blot my name out from the book of life, He's reflecting God's uh, heart towards mankind, towards Israel, where here Ellen White's using this sort of in a pejorative sense of a, um, a parent who is indulgent uh, towards their children and that saying that she's not going to do that. Now, uh, we ended up. Um, then having a discussion, I can't remember exactly how we got to that, but I, I think I was using an illustration just about how within the movement we have misrepresented God and also that just in general, many people attach themselves to the truth who are defective, you know, people with mental illnesses uh, was an example I used, which Kelly, you know, obviously felt a bit sensitive about if, if you were there yesterday, which I wasn't using in a sense as, uh, you know, somehow like those people with mental illnesses are all bad people and people who don't have me mental illnesses are all good people this type of thing. I wasn't using that illustration. I was just saying generally people who need God often attach themselves to Adventism and some of them avail themselves of the opportunity in in God changing and transforming them, and some do not. And so the ones, no matter what their mental condition is prior to becoming an Adventist, uh, some of, we, we can all misrepresent God, and all of us have. And so the idea well, there... We, yeah, all Steve, call, we all need to be... Uh, we, need, we all need God in our lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's everyone. Just, does. The, way, the way you put it there just sounded as if, you know, it's only people with mental illness need God in their lives. 
Well, yeah, but I, I, I sort of put all of us in that class to some degree or other, right? I mean, apart from God, right? Yeah. You know, obviously I have to be careful about it. But but the point that I'm making is that God attaches people to the church and to the movement who need to be converted, right? All of us need to be converted. And when we're not converted, it brings a reproach. And so those looking from the outside, you know, can see people who are defective or they can see people that are being redeemed by Christ. And obviously, if we're not redeemed by Christ, we're not going to represent the work that Christ is doing. So somehow, you know, obviously, when there's a sensitivity about a topic, sometimes I'm not as careful as I could be. So my illustration wasn't the best illustration, maybe, but it was for me, it was fine. Right. Because what what I see is that um, there's people with all kinds of problems in the church. If I look at my favorite church, which is Warburg, Warburg has a lot of defective people. You know, um, and I would include myself in them. But the thing is, they're people that God has done amazing things in their lives. And I know lots of people who have had many, many things to overcome that the average person wouldn't. And, and they can be a powerful statement of God's power. So, I mean, for me, this is obviously something that, that hits close to home as well. So, you know, no way was I sort of like putting down, you know, mentally ill people is all bad. And, you know, the other way around and that somehow, you know, uh, God only wants uh, people who don't have mental illness to join the church. That wasn't the idea. The idea was just that we have we have misrepresented God. And there's many people in the movement who have misrepresented God because of their characters, whether they had mental illnesses or not. But I just know lots of people who look at Christians and Seventh-day Adventists in particular as people who are mentally unbalanced. And I'm saying they're not wrong. That is, there as many people who are mentally unbalanced, but it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that it's just mental illnesses. So hopefully that clarifies that point. But um, uh, any other thoughts on that? I'm just backing up what you're saying. I mean, I came in a little late, but I have a son who thinks I am totally crazy because I believe in God. And this yeah. then he knew or was, he knew about the Lord at least younger. I mean, he seemed to be receptive to the message and, and then he joined joined the Masons and got into materialism and I mean mm. he's very, very bitter and very hateful. So he yeah. needs a lot of prayer. Yeah. But all, also we, you know, have people that in in a sense their criticism of the church and Adventists is kind of justified. I mean and I, I and I know when I first became an Adventist, obviously I really didn't represent, you know, how to witness to people properly. One is I don't ha- I didn't have a lot of great social skills back then, and um, so you know so I recognize that that often I misrepresented the truth, but also God through His Spirit can impress impress people with how we act and behave. So anyway, that was where the study went yesterday. We had you know, three sort of different uh, branches of study. Now, I know Dwight put a lot of these statements together. Now, I don't know if he's here because there's an iPhone. I don't know who that is. It's probably not Dwight. But uh, I'm just going to read a few more. This one we had read talking about, uh, you know, honesty in the work, how people are paid. So there's just, it's really about the integrity of, of the work of the church, uh, him that uh, I will honor him that that uh, how's how's the verse go? Be it far from me for them that honor me will I honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So that's basically we need to honor God in our actions, and if we don't, and and saying that we will be lightly esteemed, it's obviously true that God, in a sense, lightly esteems us in that, but also uh, we represent God as well, right? So intellectual power, natural ability, supposed excellent judgment will not prepare the youth to become missionaries for God. 
And so often what we have is we evaluate ourselves. Maybe our, it's our intellect. Maybe we have all kinds of different skills. Maybe we think that we're, we, we're more perceptive than other people. And, and these things could be true. But if we're unconverted, we're not going to be able to be used by God. And I think that we've often within the movement. So what, one thing that we have done as Adventists generally with with and we would, I would call us marginal, m- marginal uh, groups within Adventism, that is people who aren't highly educated or financially successful, sort of on the fringes of society, as many of us are, and even within Adventist culture, that there is this attitude towards the educated well the educated are all the bad ones and we're uneducated we're farmers and laborers and god has bypassed the educated class because they're so self-righteous and think they know so much but uh you know those people are unfit so we take statements like this in the spirit of prophecy and yet we don't realize that we ourselves are just as unfit that is it's not it doesn't matter whether you're educated or uneducated. If you're not converted, it doesn't matter. And and so if you're looking down at those people above you, so to speak, that doesn't make you any better than those people that you're looking down on. Right Now, of course, we know that there are schools. Um, I here, no one who is seeking an education for the work and service of God will be made more complete in Jesus Christ by receiving the supposed finishing touch at Ann Arbor, either in literary or medical lines. Many have been unfitted to do missionary work by attending such schools. So, of course, this is true. We know that people can, when they look to worldly education to fit them for the work of God, that's not going to do what needs to be done, right? That is, they're looking in the wrong place. But also the corollary is true. You know, many people think that, you know, being uneducated somehow is going to fit us for the work. But we need to be learned in the school of Christ. Uh, They have dishonored God by leaving him on one side and accepting man as their helper. Them that I honor, honor me, will I honor, etc. So we can do this in various ways, right? So, and this is a problem that I've seen within the conservative branches of Adventism. It's looking down upon the church upon the scholars and all these things is somehow that we're still better. And it's still the same attitude. Hi, Dwight. I'm just looking through some of these statements. Yeah, there's quite a bit with these. Yeah, I know. And I, I'm not going to read them all, as I said before, because it would just take too long. And and there is a lot of the same ideas, even though they're expressed in different ways. Okay, so just this part here from letter, letter 15, 1895. After I had witnessed the Confederacy for raising the wages of the workers in the office, the Lord brought me into the meetings of the auditing committee that settled with the ministers for their labor. Angels of God were there, making a record of everything done. Brother Henry's voice was the controlling power, cutting down wherever he pleased, deciding the wages of the workers according to his ideas and feelings. How little did anyone think that the universe of heaven were noting every transaction— Brother Henry was not a poor man. He accepted large wages for himself and gave his strong influence of securing large wages for others in the office. But these other workers whose circumstances neither he nor other members of the auditing committee took pains to ascertain were paid according to the impulse of this one man. This work will be met in that great day when every work shall be brought into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil, Jesus says, behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. The Lord of heaven is not correctly represented by many of those who claim to be representatives of him. They are transgressors of his commandments. But he declares them that honor me will I honor. So again, this brings out this this principle expands it a little bit that we can see. So one is we see that decisions have been made in the movement that we're not in accordance with God's direction, correct? Agreed. And that these were often pushed by individuals who had their own personal feelings regarding other people, regarding themselves, regarding the truth. And yet 
when we say that, you know, he that honors me will I honor. In the end, God will honor those that are faithful, right? So even if man is not going to be fair, well, God is in a sense more than fair because none of us deserve anything. And yet, you know, God is willing and wants to, to see those that respond to truth, that they're going to be fruitful, that they're going to, it doesn't mean they're not going to go through trials. Right? It's just the problem that we have within the church, within the movement, is that man's judgment is placed ahead of God. And how do, how do we judge? Like, how was, you know, if we're going to be like really specific, when it came to uh, the issues with July 18th, how did God judge all of that? Or, and how did man judge all of that? So, so what was the judgment that was made in, um, in Germany when, uh, you know, Parminder's group examined and looked at July 18th? What did they want to do with July 18th? I don't know, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even, I would not even say they did examine it. <laughs> yeah, so they didn't really examine. It. Yeah. Now, I mean, Stephen, you were sort of closer to that than anyone I know, you know, and definitely anyone here, what was happening in Germany. Because um, you had communicated with Parminder about July 18th. And, and he sort of seemed to not be opposed to it in his correspondence with you, correct, or talking with him. Uh, we had a camp meeting in Wales in June, so like just about two months prior. Yeah. And uh, Rodelio mainly presented it to Permender there. Yeah. And he didn't seem to be for or against it. Yeah. He was just sort of okay, you know. But to, my, to him, he, his argument was, well, we'll focus on November 9th. That's the main goal. You know, this would be like a distraction to focus on it. Yeah. So like yeah. this year time when uh, November 9th was happening prior to that. So mm -hmm. but when we got to Germany and we shared July 18th with a few others, he had, uh, it was like a, another approach to it totally. He was just vehemently against it. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I've noticed that with Parminder that, you know, I would share stuff with him, uh, you know, just me and him. And and he, uh, you know, he he wouldn't he wouldn't sort of commit. But later on, I would find that he was totally opposed to what I was doing, but he never let on. So, you know, I, I got the feeling that he was being, you know, sort of careful in how he was dealing with situations, because even when Heidi and I approached him like directly about some issues, you know, he was just, you know, totally, it's not any issue, there's no problems. And yet, you know, we find out later that he obviously <laughs> had all kinds of problems with us, but he would never let us know that. So it was more strategic on his part, it seemed. But but, but the point that, that, that I, I'm making here when it comes to who God will honor. So we know that the Parminder and his movement rejected July 18th. Now, I had set aside July 18th because of Tabo telling me that, you know, he didn't want me promoting it. So I respected that. Still studied it with Stephen and Odilio, you know, through emails. And uh, I know on March 27th in 2019 was the first time I talked to Odilio through uh, uh, Skype. So, and he, he urged me to not abandon July 18th. So, <clears throat> so that was kind of interesting. Um, and I told him, well, I wasn't, I was still studying it. So we, we still, you know, had some email exchanges over that. Now, when uh, Jeff took up July 18th, that wasn't at my insistence. So that was just Jeff doing that. Well, Odilio, I think he had sent him some things about it. Yeah, yeah, Odilio had sent him some things about it. That's true. But Jeff already knew about July 18th and had accepted it back in 2018. Yes. Right. So so Jeff knew about July 18th. He he knew the 252 days between November 9th, 2019 and 
you know, Jeff could have just said, well, all of this stuff is nonsense. All this time setting is wrong. You know, Parminder was wrong about November 9th and July 18th is sort of connected to it. But instead, you know, by leaving things in God's hands, I believe that 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 was then honored by God in allowing July 18th to become prominent. Because there is no doubt that if Jeff had not picked up July 18, 2020, that pretty much would have been the end of it, right? I definitely didn't have any sort of influence for July 18 that anybody was going to listen to me. And I don't think Stephen and Odilia had enough influence either. What do you think about that, Stephen? That without Jeff picking it up, it wouldn't have existed. I agree. Yeah. So by leaving things in God's hands um, and trusting God, we can see that, you know, that date and its significance became predominant. Uh, so yeah, obviously, you know, we wouldn't have, have warned Nashville. We wouldn't have had, you know, all of these things that happened in the movement without Jeff taking that up. Now, the fact that Jeff is going to repudiate all of the uh, the methods, the numbers that connected to July 18th, 1260 days afterwards, to me is very remarkable that he's going to reject basically the symbolic use of numbers as it applied to any of the things that we had done. Um, it's not really quite clear exactly because he seems to be um, not s s um, firm on it in every instance. Right. So sometimes he seems to use some of the ideas that developed, uh, especially when he tries to say that July 18th is the first disappointment, uh, just seems kind of incongruous. I mean, if July 18th was error, how can it be the first disappointment? Because was the first disappointment error in 1844? Well, just their understanding of it. Yeah, there's just certain understanding of it. But you can't say that, that that was error, that somehow, you know, it was all mistaken and that Miller shouldn't have, have made that prediction at all. Right. So so I don't quite understand Jeff's position in that regard. Now, of course, this, uh, you know, God shall bring uh, into judgment every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We know that... Um, that God understands all of the circumstances in our lives. He knows the bad things we've done. He knows where we have responded to him, that there's nothing hidden from him. And yet people act as if there is, that they can hide their motives and their actions from God. And of course, that's not the case. That can't be done. And something that we need to think about um, and, of course, the Lord of heaven is not correctly represented by many who claim to be representatives of him. And that's just true. We can see that in our own lives. Right. So so when we follow God, when we honor God, we can trust that he will honor us. Uh, Daniel and his companions saw their danger and determined that they would not eat of the king's meat or drink of his wine. But his brave yet courteous presentation of the matter to the prince who had them in charge by his brave yet courteous presentation of the matter of, to the prince who had them in charge. Daniel secured the privilege of a 10 days trial of, this, of the simple pulse and water they had chosen for food. The results, when at the end of 10 days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than, the, than, than that of the faces of the children with which did eat the portion of the king's meat, decided the matter. Daniel and his fellows were permitted to carry out their principles. Right. The fruits of their self-denial were manifest in physical and mentor, mental vigor. No such students as these Hebrew youth were to be found in the courts of Babylon. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of three years, these Hebrew captives were brought in before Nebuchadnezzar. And their examination took place. And in all matter of wisdom and understanding that the king required of them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. The Lord has said, them that honor me will I honor. Um, so we can see how we need to follow these principles and not take things into our own hands. 
And there's often a temptation to do so. We, we see something, we see some injustice, or uh, maybe we experience an injustice and we, we try to uh, correct it. We need to wait upon God. In the experience of Nebuchadnezzar is contained a lesson to which we should give heed, lest we fall into temptation. So it says here, the perils of the last days are upon us and we should watch and pray, read and heed the lessons that are given us in the book of Daniel and Revelation. In mercy, the Lord has wrought in behalf of the sanitarium, the college and the review and herald office. Just as long as those in connection with these institutions walk humbly with God, heavenly intelligences will cooperate with them. But let all bear in mind the fact that God has said, them that honor me will I honor. The Lord manifested himself to the four Hebrew youth in the courts of Babylon. They were surrounded with temptations on every hand, yet God has set a hedge about them in order that they should not be corrupted because they preserve their simplicity of faith. There's a lesson in this for us. Now, what does she mean by simplicity of faith? What does she mean they preserve their simplicity of faith? Could it be childlike faith? Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's just trusting in God without having to have everything proven to you. Now, it may seem sort of contradictory to what we're doing to some degree, but many people bring in all kinds of doubts, right? That is, and, and they do that by trusting in man, right? So when our faith is put on God, there is a simplicity of faith. When man gets in the way, can we see that it becomes uh, complicated? Do you understand what I'm saying? So, oh, man go on, Angie. It. what's that? Oh, I'm just saying, man, man, man taints it. Like what I do a lot of times, I just said, Lord, you promised, and then I I quote that verse or part parts of that verse, and I said, if it be Thy will, like I'm pretty sure it's Your will because You promised it. Please fulfill it, and He right. does. Right. So, for instance, if we're going to start to try to sort out, you know, all of the different people that exist and who are we going to trust? Like, even in a situation like, well, let's go back to July 18th. OK, so we got, you know, Parminder rejecting July 18th, Parminder and, Tess, and, and Jeff accepting July 18th. Now, if you're going to try to decide about people. Uh, our knowledge of people, our ability to judge the situation is limited, right? That is, we can get very, very confused in the whole myriad of opinions and ideas and personalities. But if, but in the simplicity of faith, we, we step above all of these things that are happening around us. And we just trust that God's will will be done. That is, we become faithful in the things that God has given us to do and trust the results and how that's going to come about to God. When, when we try to step in and figure these things out, when we try to solve these problems, and, and, and I would go back to our studies dealing with A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner in, in 1888, and I think part of the failure, at least of Jones, was that he tried to take the work into his own hands at a certain point. That is, when he saw the work failing, that, that, that the message of righteousness by faith was, was really rejected, and that, that the people around him were two-faced. You know, people didn't really let on, because, you know, Ellen White had supported it, so people had to at least outwardly show that they were supporting what Jones and Wagner were presenting. And yet, Inwardly, they weren't, and secretly, they were talking amongst themselves how, you know, the problems with A.T. Jones. And A.T. Jones ran into this, this problem, and we saw it in his, uh, his uh, presentation that he did to the General Conference in 1909, and, and the whole situation that was happening, all the political things happening behind the scenes. And, and I think that he just got caught too much up in those things and didn't have... He didn't preserve the simplicity of faith. And, and I know I've done that many times in my life, too. So to just trust that God can take care of a situation is that childlike trust. But in spite of what we see, God sits enthroned. And that's what I did with July 18th. You know, at least I can say 
There's one time in my life that I just trusted that God was going to take care of that situation. And, and the one reason why I did it is I didn't have the trust in self. Like I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't sort of adamant that I knew what was right. Uh, I just knew that if it was true, that God would take care of it. And so for me, it was really a miracle to see what happened with July 18th. So God says, him, him that honors me, I will honor, right? And that honor me, I will honor. So I think that we need to be able to trust in that. Counselors of the character that God chose for Moses are needed by the president of the general conference. It was the privilege of Elder Olson to at least express his preferences as to the men who should be his counselors. It was his privilege to discern between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. But a strange blindness was upon him. There's been a leavening influence upon human minds, and it has been most painful. For years, God has been dishonored. Now, if we're going to try to say, you know, uh, change Elder Olson for Jeff, we, we should be able to do that here. Was there a strange blindness upon Jeff in regard to the people that he put around him as counselors? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. And, and, and Jeff almost noticed it. I mean, I mean, he did notice it, actually, which I find strange. So if we talk about a strange blindness, because um, it was at one point in one of the studies, um, and I think it was the one I presented on Samuel Snow's letters in connection with July 18th, where Jeff saw clearly July 18th. So this is back in November of 2018, or at least late October, that Jeff says, now I see why many people have tried to tell me not to listen to Theodore. Now, he didn't say it like in that they were right. It was in, they, they were wrong, that, that there was a truth being withheld by the people around him in the things that they would say about me. Right. So he could see that there was a truth there. And now he knows why there was so much prejudice against me. Now, of course, when he went to Brazil, and came back, um, he never talked to me after that. And they had basically bullied him into rejecting July 18th. And um, so I thought it was really strange that Jeff uh, listened to those counselors. Um, so there was a strange blindness that was upon him, but he almost had the scales taken from his eyes, at least for a moment he did. But even after he took up July 18th, I wasn't really part of what was happening with FFA. Nobody was really, I mean, Jeff would write and ask me the odd question about things and I'd write and give him some observations. But there wasn't really uh, the same relationship with me that he had ha had prior to when I was at the school in 2018, which we seemed to have a pretty good relationship even though there was people who were telling him not to trust me that I had some kind of hidden agenda or something like that. And yet the people who did have the hidden agendas uh, were his counselors telling him that. So we see that, that this happens. Now, unless he walks in the light of life, the president of the general conference uh, will make many mistakes. He will continue to do as he has done in the past in heeding the calls made for his presence at the, in the several conferences and will absorb means in t talking or in taking with him men who he knows do not appreciate the work for this time. Now, is this true that there were people that Jeff had with him that he knew were not converted or even women that were resistant to many of the truths that were being taught by the movement? Did he have people around him that he knew that was the case? I would have to say yes. Yeah, this is true, right? So he knew that there were unconverted people that he was trying to influence, particularly family members, by bringing them into his council and, and listening to them. And that was partly what blinded him to what was happening. So he would, he would accept their testimony even though they had never bore uh, the fruit of conversion. And that was a, mi a mistake Jeff made. And, and we saw that, you know, you know, with Bronwyn, we saw her resistance to many, many things 
in, in the studies. And Jeff, of course, because it's his daughter, he's going to sort of excuse that and be more patient than he would have been if it had been someone else. And, and other people, you know, he was, was definitely less patient with who he should have heeded. So, so it's a difficult thing, you know, again, talking about these types of things. But we can learn from this lesson ourselves. Um, the enemy is seeking to use every device with which, uh, which will cripple this institution. He seeks to make it a common thing through those whom he connects with it. When the workers are educated to think of this great center as related to God and under his supervision, when they realize that it is a channel through which light from heaven is to be communicated to the world, great respect and reverence will be shown to it. The best thoughts and noblest feelings will be cultivated and brought into the work that the heavenly intelligences may cooperate with human beings. Now, you know, so when we when we bring people into the work who are, you know, let's say not even Seventh-day Adventists to do aspects of the work, is that honoring God? I don't think so. Yeah. So so why is that a mistake to bring relatives to to help with the work in a hope that it's going to uh, influence them in the proper direction. Why is that wrong? What? How? How does that? How does that wrong? Because it can seem right to us. We can say, well, you know, my son or my grandson or my nephew, they're not they're not really converted. Uh, they're not really an Adventist, but I'm going to connect them to the work and give them some responsibilities. We see this in the church as well. Uh, people who are unconverted, we give them p- p- positions of responsibility so that they'll feel more uh, committed to the church. Uh, Why is this wrong? Because it is establishing a link, or as in one of the prior articles stated, a confederacy Mm -hmm. with man. We are not in league then with God. Okay. So, So can we be more specific about why it's not good? You know, more specific, like in the details, there's more details. So are we going to, are we under an illusion that we're actually going to help that person? Too many times, yes. Yeah. So why, why can't we help the person in that way? By connecting them with the work? Because we don't have the power. Okay. So we don't have the power. There needs to be something that God does in their life. But they can also then believe that they don't need to be converted. I'm going to use sort of a um, an uncouth sort of comparison, but you know, it's it's like the idea. Well, I don't know how to say this, but you know, there are guys who they women they will sleep with a man, thinking that if they if they sleep with the man, then eventually they'll fall in love with me and they will marry me. But what they do is they get, you know, they get free milk without purchasing the cow, right? Does that make sense? It right. certainly does. Yeah. So, so people can think, well, I, I don't need to be converted. I can be a part of the church. And, and they think they're a part of the church. They think that's what it means to be part of the church. They don't understand the sacredness of the responsibility that's been given to them. They can't appreciate it. And so we end up with nominal Adventists, people who are Adventists in name only. They're only there for social reasons. And they see those who are truly converted as fanatics. Right. So it, it's going to backfire. Right. It's it's not going to help that person to become converted. And they can think because they're associated with this work and they're un- they know they're not converted in some ways, but they don't really know what conversion means. They know that they 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 receive all the benefits without the sacrifice. Now, of course, the other thing that it does to the work is it brings unconverted people into the work. And so decisions are made that aren't after God because the workers are not consecrated to God. And so it it really muddies the waters as far as decisions are concerned. And it sets up a precedent for making decisions that are meant to uh, placate or pacify people who aren't in accordance with God. Right. So. You know, I mean, I could be really specific about some of the things that I saw, but what I can say is that, you know, decisions were made about individuals only because of how it affected, you know, Jeff's family rather than the Lord's work. 
right? So again, hard stuff to talk about, but, but we have to really be honest about this type of stuff. As the workers realize they are in the presence of the angels whose eyes are too pure to behold iniquity, what a strong restraint they will place on thoughts, words, and actions. They will be given moral strength, for the Lord says them that honor me I will honor. Every worker will possess a precious experience and a power and faith that is stronger than all circumstances. They will be able to say the Lord is in this place. The angels of God will be in every room. The power of an inward life will circulate through the office. There will be a power in the lives of the workers that will be felt throughout the entire institution. And in my experience, this wasn't the case at the School of the Prophets. There was actually a fairly oppressive spirit, a spirit of fear and, and distrust. And that's, that's not something that's of God. Right. Brethren, you must rise higher in your service. The office is not to be regarded as a common business, business institution. All who acknowledge God in his appointed channels, who act as faithful stewards in any place where they can do God's service, will be honored by God. Right? And we can see that this is true of the church, that this doesn't occur. And it was true in this movement. Uh, just concerning your uh, statement. Yeah. What would you experience? Still the prophets. Yeah. So would you apply that to when you were first there in 2016? No, 2016 was different. 2018 I'm talking about. So in 2016, um, I, 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 I thought it was, you know, very equal to my experience that I had when I was at Silver Hills. There was a spirit of cooperation, of love, of kindness, of gratefulness um, with, with the, you know, Michael and uh, Brittany and uh, Tyler working with them. And, and even with the teachers that were teaching the courses. But definitely it wasn't that way in 2018. Yeah, so I'm mostly talking about in 2018. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me clarify that. <laughs> because, yeah, 2016 was a fantastic experience. But 2018 was not right from the beginning. So, And, and I felt that the work that we were doing was useful in 2016. 2018, we were doing things that weren't useful, which was really hard on me. And everybody, there was a, a spirit of discontent amongst everyone with Bronwyn. And you could see people were very tense when Bronwyn was around. And that wasn't really the case. Well, she wasn't around much in 2016. Right, Stephen? She only came like near the end there. Um, yeah, I don't know how high she was in 2018 to 2016 well in 2018 she was there all the time in 2016 she 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 was not well or something for the first couple of months that we were there she sort of yeah that's know, right yeah so things were taken care of by others so anyway uh, in every place where important interests have been established there are men who love god and have a measure of ability these men need to be instructed how to use their talents. Let them carry the responsibilities that they can bear. Teach them to put their trust in God, not finite man, and to become workers who can be depended upon. Do not lead them to think that they must in every emergency depend on men at a great distance. Let them seek the Lord for themselves, which of course is extremely important that we, you know, have that individual responsibility given to workers. Uh, to make decisions in connection with God instead of controlling the work. Unless there is a most earnest decided purpose to cultivate our own spirituality to a higher degree, accepting light. So uh, how do we cultivate our own spirituality to a higher degree? What do we have to do? She says accepting light. Close is, to God. Yeah. yeah. So accepting light is how we do that. And we can see that people often reject light. So if we don't accept light, the light we already have becomes darkness. So unless there is a constant necessity felt for prayer to our Heavenly Father for his wisdom and a searching of the scriptures to know his way and to be kept by the power of God, then it will be very easy to drift farther and farther away from God and unite our interests with those who know not the truth and who will not accept the truth. We need spirituality to discharge our duties daily in the fear of God. 
The Bible history tells us that when men deliberately turn away from God and the messages he sends them, the Lord turns away from them. What is the result? Therefore, I scattered them with a whirlwind among all nations. Zechariah 7, verse 14. He that honoreth me will I honor. He that despiseth me. And the message I send, I will lightly esteem. So it ties together the studies that uh, Doyd's been doing on Sabbath in Zechariah and our studies here in the morning in, in 1 Samuel. This is not making God a hard master. It is simply a declaration of the effect of the cause and eternal necessity of results. So what's the effect? What's the cause and what's the effect? So it's just to, that, that's not, um, you know, God's not being arbitrary in this sense. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil, right? So as light comes to us, we, we have to accept it. If we don't accept that light, we go into darkness. And, and God turns away from us. Right? He's, we're going to be scattered. So if we look at the condition of the movement at the present time, now, now Jeff would probably agree with me in this part, is that the movement made mistakes. Right? His view is that the movement made mistakes, that he made a mistake in accepting all of this light dealing with chronology and symbolic use of numbers. That would be the mistake that he believes the movement made. We believe that the mistake that we made is that we were not converted that we didn't really accept the light that God gave us that was meant to correct us. But we both can agree that the condition of the movement at the present time is because of, that is, that is going to be the effect of this cause, right? The cause is a rejection of light, of correction. And the result is that the movement is scattered. Amen. Now, it's kind of interesting when we when we think about um, uh, July 18 and we think about the 252 days between November 9th, 2019 and July 18, 2020, that we we have the 252, which is symbolic of a 2520. And, you know, it was a test for this movement. We, we looked at it as something to do with, you know, the church or the world or whatever. But really, it was a test for this movement. Were we willing to follow God or not? The sun of righteousness will shine upon all who follow Christ. They that follow me shall not walk in darkness. We belong to Christ. He has bought us, bought our children, and we can educate them to think more highly of earthly pleasures and earthly treasures than of the heavenly. If we give the world all the advantage of obtaining mind, heart, and soul service, every chink is filled. The worldly tide fills every space, and the word of God is left out. The bright light proceeding from Christ is not admitted. The spirit, the principles that dwell in the heart of the disobedient, dwell in the heart of those who link up in harmony with them. So we shouldn't have a connection with the world. And yet we educate ourselves to do so. And I mean, one of the big problems I've always had with Adventism is the way in which the, the organization functions after the pattern of the world in such as nominating committees, how we deal with board meetings, how we make decisions. You know, I, I always believe in consensus. That is, if you have a church and it's going to make a decision, you want to have the support of the whole church, not of 51% in a board. Does that make sense to people? Yes, yeah, it does. And, and my, my argument that I made to a pastor that we had who was just, well, the board voted it through. You guys have to accept it was, well, you know, they're not going to. <laughs> right. You, the board voting something has has very little power. It's it's a volunteer organization. If you don't have consensus, you don't get support. You know, so it doesn't matter how many, you know, how much percentage you get uh, of a board if the church itself isn't supportive of whatever action the board has decided. It's, it's sort of a moot point. The board really has no power. And, and he couldn't understand that. No, hopefully he learned that over time. But the really good leaders that I've seen are the ones who can actually get a consensus. And it's not that they're, they're pandering to, uh, you know, to others. It's just that they are able to inspire others to support 
what God is supporting. And, and usually when it's just a majority, it's man's ideas that are being pushed. When it's a consensus within a church, it's usually God's spirit working. But is there not times when you might have one or two people rejecting that, you know, not going along with the majority? Yeah, well, that's what consensus doesn't mean 100 percent. Right. And, and so in consensus, they, in consensus, the people who. So what I see in Werber Church, which is my main experience in dealing with this type of thing, is. That those at least that are dissenting need to be heard. And need to feel that they have been heard. And even if they feel that they have been, if they feel that they have been heard, even if their decision isn't accepted, the vast majority of the times they're going to be supportive of the de decision of the church. But if they're shut out and not heard, then you're not going to have any support from them. Does that make sense, Stephen? Yes. So you're yeah. saying that 51% is not consensus, but what say? If you get 80 percent, would that be OK? Um, well, it's not particularly like that. So but the way that we've done it in Warburg, if there if there is more than one person who is vehemently opposed to something, the decision of the church. Then it doesn't happen. That That's the way it's been done in the past. So we've had boards make decisions. And then, you know, after the board uh, makes a decision, Everybody goes and talks to everyone else about the decision of the board. And if there's somebody that's opposed to it, it goes back to the board and the board discusses it again and they consider that. But generally what happens is that the people, at least who are heard, feel like they're part of the church. I've never had it where, you know, an individual has, has stopped the, the decision of the church as a whole and not supported the decision of the church, even when they've been opposed. I'm one of those persons who, you know, sometimes was the only sole voice, but because my voice was at least heard, I still supported the decisions of the church. You know, things that weren't contrary to God's word, right? Uh, that's a different is issue altogether. Jeff, you have a comment? It's just you're, you're unmuted. Oh, no. Yeah, I left my speaker on. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. I mean, this does work in practical terms. When thing, when people are included as part of a group, they will support the decisions of the group, even if they don't agree with them. But when people are pushed out on the periphery and never heard, they're often never heard from again, <laughs> right? Now, of course, you have to consider, I mean, it could be people who are just unconverted, people who are not really following God. You know, there, there's all kinds of things. But we're talking about, you know, people that you can respect. They're part of the church. Um, and and um, what you don't want to have is this worldly policy of pushing things upon people through manipulation of some sort because the majority has voted. When you, when you have a, a church that's divided, you know, 51 to 49 percent in in an emotional issue. There's something really wrong with that church and the way it's functioning. And especially if that 51 percent uh, pushes upon the other 49, something that they don't uh, agree with. It's not a good situation. It's not a harmonious <laughs> church. Right. You know, um, that church isn't going to stand. It's going to end up being scattered. Okay. All who are self-exalted and speak evil of others are denying Christ. All who devote their time and thought and affections to dress deny Christ. All who inconsiderately let flow a stream of idle, foolish words, jesting and joking, unkind, mocking words deny Christ. Many who act apart in our Sabbath schools as teachers need a decidedly changed experience before they reveal Christ. They love self, and they interpose their love of self between the soul and Christ. Their outward apparel hangs out the sign of their service. Those who devote time and money to outward display dishonor their Redeemer by misrepresenting him to the world. They confess by their apparel that they are of the world. 
as the congregations assemble on the Sabbath to say that this act, by this act that they worship God, many things in their apparel testify against them. Their influence denies the presence and peace and grace of Christ in the soul. So this is a, a very powerful paragraph in the spirit of prophecy and something that all of us, it, it is a rebuke to every one of us, right? Especially in the speaking evils, evil of others. That's something that um, we've all, we all have done and we all have seen done. And um, when I, when I read this, and this is not me trying to speak evil of others, it's just, all who inconsiderately let flow a stream of idle, foolish words, jesting and joking, unkind, mocking words deny Christ. Uh, one of the reasons I stopped uh, participating in the Canadian group, and probably really the main reason, besides the fact they didn't want me there, uh, was the type of talk that went on on Sabbath regarding other people, the jesting, the joking, the unkind, the mocking words. That, that occurred in the Canadian group and to some degree the American group. So I think in my experience, the Canadian group was worse, but you know, they were sort of somewhat the same in the afternoon. I just did not think that that was something that represented uh, God in this movement. And this sort of idle talk, you know, has always been one of the problems I've had with uh, fellowshipping with people on Sabbath afternoon. So I always much rather just not fellowship with people, you know, groups of people. If I can just be with one family or a couple, um, it's usually fine because you can direct the conversation into spiritual things. But the more people you have in the room, the more that the conversation goes in this direction. It takes uh, the low path. And that was true of you know, the type of conversations that go on. One of the reasons I really don't like doing the visiting on Sabbath on Zoom, even though I know like Kelly would like it, is is I just don't think it it, it ends up honoring God. I mean it can, right? I'm not saying that it can't. But when it's when it's Sabbath, even though you know I like fellowship, I, I do like just the time alone with God and to consider the things that that I've studied. And um so you know, so it's something that we always have to recognize in ourselves. I don't know much about talk, it. Well, if you're talking, you have a, have a certain topic. But yeah. God in the Bible, yeah. you're talking about, if you're just talking, that's that's okay. Yeah, but it's it's easy when you have a large group of people, especially on Zoom, I find it's even worse because, you know, there's lots of people there and it seems like the talkers tend to be the ones who take the low road. Um, it just gets more and more sensational, right? And because I've listened to some of these recordings too of things that were said about me, uh, completely untrue, and and just done in such a mocking manner that I, I was ashamed for them that they could actually publicly say those types of things about another individual in the manner that they did. Like we, we can point out that there's problems in the movement. But if we do it in a mocking and ingesting and uh, sort of a self-righteous way that we're better than others, that definitely doesn't honor God. And, you know, so it's something that we we really need to think about, like Sabbath conversations. That we, you, know, you go to a potluck, what are the conversations that are going on? You know, sometimes they're good, right? But uh, it's something that I've always been very careful about, you know, and not just on Sabbath, but any time, you know, we have to be careful about our language. And I'm not saying I'm always 100% perfect in this regard. I'm definitely not. Because there's many times I've said things that, that I've been ashamed of that I've actually said them. And generally, when, when I do that, if I have opportunity, I'm going to apologize for those, those things that I've said. But we need to recognize this about ourselves. All of these things. Now, you know, I'm not really a person for outward show, apparel and stuff like that. But, you know, but this could be in, you know, the type of car we drive, how we dress. It's probably often more relates to women than men, but uh, men usually don't care much about their dress. But, you know, there's this all this outward as, as display uh, that show that we're not there for the right reason, even though we make a pretension of being there to worship God. 
that, and it could not just be in how we dress, but how we communicate with others, that it's, it's more about drawing attention to ourselves in some way. And this can even be over spiritual things. So, you know, Christ needs to be glorified in all things. Christ declared those that will, who honor him will he honor. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. Much talking does not speak forth the praises of Christ. Here's a work to be done. Every soul, unless daily converted to Christ, will dishonor God and make the whole universe of heaven ashamed of them. They dishonor their own souls and do great injustice to themselves. The author of our being claims for us, as his subjects, more and a great deal more of an altogether different character than we give him. He has entrusted us with ability to learn of him out of his word and with power to obey every requirement of his word. The truth is able to make us wise unto salvation. Now we think here in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, just kind of a strange expression. Well, I think it's words coming from an un unclean, un impure heart. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you a, a contemporary English version of this. If you will say the wrong thing, if you talk too much. <laughs> so be sensible and watch what you say. Now, of course, that's a paraphrase, but I, I think it kind of gives uh, the sense in a much more colloquial manner. You know, I mean, if, if a, a lawyer will tell you that, <laughs> you know, it's better to remain silent. <laughs> And say anything, right? But but this you know this is is uh, a problem that if you know if we just sort of talk for the sake of talking, we have to be careful about those those words that we say. Silence so, is elderly. What's that, William? I said si silence is eloquent. Silence is eloquence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and, and I've been. You know, I tend to talk a lot, but you'd be surprised at how many times I haven't said things that, that I'm glad I sure didn't say uh, that came into my mind. So I had to learn that as time went on, sometimes not to say everything that came into my mind. And, and sometimes, you know, I think about the conversation yesterday, you know, like I gave this illustration, which, you know, hit some sensitive nerves and which wasn't the intention, but Sometimes, you know, we we talk and then we, we, we try to say, well, you know, I, I didn't mean this and, and and it can it can sort of all unravel at some point. The Lord has said that his representative men must be respected and regarded for their work's sake. So when I think about uh you know, so there's a work that a person has, there's representative men, like a pastor. You know, I don't think that we do well when we just talk down about our pastor all the time, even if they have some defects in character. And this would be true, you know, even when we had Tabo as our leader in Canada, we did everything we could to try to support him and help him. We knew he was inexperienced. You know, he was young. Uh, he didn't quite understand what he was doing, but we still respected him because of his his responsibility that had been given to him, even though, you know, really shouldn't have been given to him, but still he had that responsibility. But sometimes we can tear down the person. Uh, you know, we can think of King David. How did he deal with Saul? Was Saul in the right? We, we can say Saul definitely Saul wasn't. wasn't. Yeah. Obviously Saul wasn't. But and David had an opportunity to kill him, but he wasn't going to kill the Lord's anointed. Right. He had respect for that office. And, and we need to show that same type of respect. And, and sometimes in that respect, uh, it does mean talking to like I have had times where I will talk to a pastor themselves directly about a concern that I have. But I'm not going to talk to other people about that concern. Right. Where often we just talk about the pastor or other people. You know, without actually talking to the person themselves, which is not constructive. Yeah, um, but I've seen that selfishness is brought into the work of preparing buildings for his service. The workers must avoid weaving in one thread of their selfish spirit. You know, I wish sometimes Ellen White gave more details in regard to exactly what that would be, how selfishness was woven into this preparing buildings. 
Now, here she says, I see so much stingy practice with God, so much downright robbery of him, I am amazed. Now, so here, this would be, I guess, building things, but um, not giving all to God. Would that be like, you know, building a church that's that's not honoring God because, you know, they, they build it lower quality because they don't want to spend the money? I'm not really sure in this statement how exactly that that would be. But it seems to be that, yeah, that, that's part of it. Worldly business on the Sabbath, and you know, that we don't seek honor of men. We need to be pure. So humility that's needed. This is a good statement. We've said this lots of time, times. But the Lord knows that if we look to man and to trust man, we are leaning on an arm of flesh. He invites our confidence. There's no limit to his power. Think of the Lord Jesus and his merits and his love, but do not seek to find the defects and dwell upon the mistakes that others have made. Call to mind your, the things worthy of your recognition and your praise. And if you are sharp to discern errors in others, be more sharp to recognize the good and praise the good. You may, if you criticize yourself, find things just as objectionable as that which you see in others. Then let us work constantly to strengthen one another in the most holy faith. So, you know, we've said many times, it's easy to see the faults in others. It's much more difficult to see the faults in yourselves. And supporting others, even when they have defects in character, that, that you are seeking to, now we're not talking about completely unconverted people who make, you know, and some who make no pretension of, of religion. So this isn't a contradiction. But you, we need to recognize that that all of us are a mixture, that uh, there's definitely defects in each one of our characters. And it's easy to just dismiss a person by looking at a defect in their character, right? So that's not, and, and often, of course, if we have, uh, if we're sharp to discern errors in others, it's usually because that's something in ourselves. It, it uh, strikes a chord with, with our own defect. Now, some of these are sort of repetitive statements. Okay, so this one here, uh, Nehemiah found the book of the law, and the eighth chapter of Nehemiah gives the peculiars, uh, particulars of the influence that the reading of God's requirements had upon the people. In the ninth chapter, uh, the works of the Lord in behalf of his people are repeated. The sins of the people in turning from God are pointed out. These sins had separated them from God, and he had permitted them to be brought under the control of heathen nations. God demonstrated to the people for whom he had done so much that he would not serve with their sins. The true condition of things is stated in the first chapter of Nehemiah. The Lord indeed wrought, not through those who refused to serve him with singleness of purpose, who had corrupted their ways before him, but through Nehemiah, for he was registered in the books of heaven as a man. God has said, them that honor me will I honor. Nehemiah showed himself to be a man, whom God could use to put down false principles and to restore heaven-born principles, which had been supplanted, and God honored him. The Lord will use his workmen, who are as true as steep to principle, who will not be swayed by the sophistries of backsliders who have lost their spiritual eyesight. So we definitely need more Nehemiahs. We need to be Nehemiahs. In his work, Nehemiah kept the honor and glory of God ever in view. The governors that had been before him had dealt unjustly with the people and had taken of them bread and wine beside 40 shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people, but so did not I, Nehemiah declares, because of the fear of God. Right. So some definite uh, lessons that uh, this movement and thus his individuals need to take to heart just dealing with John Harvey Kellogg. Would that there were men who had the same zeal for the master, the same courtesy, the same for the love of the truth that Dr. Kellogg has. He has not betrayed his trust. The Lord has wrought with him in surgical operations, giving him wisdom and success that the world marvels at. Men not of our faith feel that although Dr. Kellogg is a Seventh-day Adventist, yet he has wisdom and knowledge and wide influence. They feel that it would be the height of folly to ignore this. Right. So this is in 1899. This is 
the book, The Living Temple, was published, what, 1905? If I remember correctly. Anybody know the date of that? So during this, this period, Kellogg here is, um, is doing a work, right? If Dr. Kellogg will continue to walk humbly with the Lord, God says to his servant, then that honor me, I will honor. He must not feel annoyed by the conduct of those he thinks do not act in harmony with the great and good work God has permitted him to do. Neither must he be influenced by man's appreciation or disparagement of the work. If he is yoked up with Christ, the work will surely advance and nothing can stay its progress. Now, what actually ha happened to Kellogg in this regard, what she's talking about? Was he annoyed with the conduct of those who he thought did not act in harmony with the great and good work? Did Kellogg start to take personally uh, some of the opposition to what he was doing within the church? I believe he did. Yeah, he did, right? So you can see here, that Ellen White's statement is prescient, um, that it uh, perceives something that actually ended up being a problem for Kellogg. She says, I know that when admonitions and warnings have been given, Dr. Kellogg has not despised these warnings and set them aside. He has not worked in order to get rich. And the work that is 1903 is uh, Living Temple was published, right? So four years later. And we're going to see actually, I think it's in 1901, at uh, the general conference that that some of the issues, it could have been later, could have been 1903 general conference, but there definitely was a division between Kellogg and the ministers. And it was over the control of the sanitarium that uh, Kellogg's going to sort of get his hackles up. The work that is done to relieve suffering humanity is of more value to him than a world, a world of gold. He has gathered in all the outcasts he can that he may be uplifted and reformed to, and see God as their restorer. God approves of his work in this line. Let the brethren appreciate this work. Christ is still saying, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. The greatest missionary work that can be done in our world is to work in ministerial lines combined with medical missionary work. The truth is going forth from the sanitarium at Battle Creek as from no other center in our world. Those who have stood up to criticize should instead have participated in the work, showing that they have been enabled by the Holy Spirit to understand that the Lord has used Dr. Kellogg as his man of opportunity to do a great and good work. So one of the things that and I don't know how much people know about uh, the work with Kellogg and what happened, but basically there was a division between, and this is a simplification, but between the medical work and the ministerial lines. And one is many of our ministers weren't vegetarians. So obviously they weren't eating unclean foods, but they did not see the value in uh, what Kellogg was doing. Um, there was also criticisms in regard to the type of people that he was helping at times. Also, Kellogg uh, had control of the sanitarium and they wanted the sanitarium to be controlled by the conference. And so there was a fight over that issue of control. And, you know, Kellogg says ownership means control, right? He didn't want them controlling the work because he didn't consider that they understood the work. So, so there was a big issue there. Now, we know it manifested itself in these external forms dealing with uh, pantheism with the book, The Living Temple, which is, is even though it's it's not you know full blown pantheism pagan pantheism it it plants seeds or ideas that were popular in England which E J Wagner uh, who is also a doctor um, had uh, supported uh, while he was in England and and these ideas came over to uh, um, the United States influenced Dr Kellogg so they thought these were great wonderful spiritual ideas. And a lot of the ideas where Ellen White is talking about spiritualism in this context uh, had to do with these ideas um, dealing with pantheism. And some people try to apply these to the ideas of the Holy Spirit. So they, they take these statements out of context where Ellen White's talking about pantheism, and they try to say, well, anybody who believes in the Holy Spirit believes in pantheism. So anyway, that's a whole other side. But uh, a person, we, you really need to read a lot of these uh, original documents in regard to what was happening in Spirit of Prophecy, where she talks about these issues.
Okay, so we're done for today. We're going to come back to this stuff on Sunday. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Not really. Okay. Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We pray for one another. We pray for Kelly and, and for Jacob who weren't here this morning. We just pray that you can bless them and uh, bless all who watch these videos. We know, Lord, that we have so much to learn and so much of this counsel uh, speaks against our own characters. So we ask for forgiveness and that we can truly honor you um, so that your name will be glorified upon this earth. We pray for our studies uh, tomorrow evening and on Sabbath. We ask that you can help us to prepare our hearts to receive light for our path. Be with each person. Watch over them, our families, loved ones. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.